Hey everyone, this is Athletes and Antiquities. Today, I want to explain the two fundamental types of rarity in the card collecting hobby and why one is a lot more valuable than the other. So today's episode is all about rarity. Rarity drives the entire card collecting hobby. It's the reason we go to the store to buy packs. It's the reason we pay more for one thing over, the, over another. And the chase of rare items is what keeps the hobby alive. I always say if the 52 Mantle and the Pikachu Illustrator were sold on shelves, they're abundant, they were very cheap, the allure to them would be gone. There, there wouldn't be a chase to obtain them. It wouldn't be, there would, there, would be, there would be no difficulty and with no difficulty, there's no satisfaction. That's why if every item, if every card was one cent, you could very easily complete a collection. But what, what's the point? You know, it, it's easy. There's no, it, there's, it's not a journey. And that's kind of what card collecting is about. That's why people stay in the hobbies. They have a, a lofty goal and they, they take years to finish it. They either finish a team set or a hall of fame collection or whatever it may be. It's difficult. It takes time. And that's all because of rarity. Now I see two different types of rarity in the hobby. And this is entirely my opinion. This is just what I've noticed in the years I've been in the hobby. Uh, but I see these two different types of rarity are manufactured rarity and genuine rarity. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain both of those, both of the definitions that I made for them. And I'm gonna show you examples for both of these and show you why I made this distinction and why I think one is much more valuable than the other. So my definition for genuine rarity is rarity that is formed naturally. There's no, there's no direct intent from the manufacturer for that item to be rare. It comes out naturally and with that, there's usually a story involved. And then there's manufactured rarity, which is rarity that is intentionally imposed on the item to drive chase for a product, to create value out of thin air, basically. And I find genuine rarity to be much more valuable than manufactured rarity. And I'm gonna show you some examples so you can kind of distinguish what I'm talking about. Maybe you can, maybe you agree, maybe you disagree, but the easiest way to tell manufactured rarity, the most like egregious example of manufactured rarity is serialized cards. This is literally a stamp put on a card to tell you this card is rare. Here's how rare it is. It's a very lazy way to add demand, but it works clearly. So here we have a Santonio San Holmes X Fractor. This, it's, I know it's hard to see because there's so much hollow on it. So bear with me if it's kind of difficult, but this card is numbered to 250. This is its refractor counterpart. This X Fractor was manufactured to be rarer than the refractor. It's the same card, essentially. It's the same picture, the same player, same rookie year. They were released in the same product. But this card was given glitter. It was given, given glamor. And most importantly, it was given a stamp to tell you this card is rarer in case it wasn't clear by the kind of obnoxious like checkered pattern on the X Fractors. They have this stamp to say, hey, in case you didn't know, this card is rare, this one isn't. And that's kind of a really important distinction because that wasn't really happening until the 90s card boom. When they try to find a way to separate themselves from other manufacturers, they said, hey, our cards are rare. See, there's a number to 100 card, a number to 10, whatever it may be. And they imposed that rarity on their own product to make that card more valuable, to make their product more valuable, to sell more. And even without uh, stamps, well, this one does have a stamp, but this is like a Reggie Bush gold from 2006. Because it's from 06, the golds were numbered to 2006. This is 1171 out of 2006, not nearly as rare as a 250 or something, but this was manufactured. They just put the gold border on this and said, this one's rare, here's how rare it is. And all the, all the golds were numbered to this, but it feels like, I, it's, I like it. I like the color, especially on a Saints jersey, like the color match with the gold, it looks good. 
and I would I prefer it obviously over a non gold version, but the rarity it feels contrived. And same thing with first edition base. You might say, oh, like first edition base is so classic. How could you, um, how could you uh, throw shade on that in some capacity? And I love first edition base, but the rarity was manufactured. They put that stamp there intentionally to add rarity to the item to sell more. They distinguished it from, well, at the time it was like Shadowless was just normal, but they distinguished it from the other cards with that stamp exclusively to say this was a shorter printed item. These cards will probably, it's more of a collector focus. These cards will probably hold more value. That was, that was their goal and they were right, obviously. But that stamp, it's the same thing with the serialized number. The serial numbers and the stamps and stuff like that, it's printed on the card to create rarity. But genuine rarity is different. And these two cards have genuine rarity. And I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna tell you guys like the stories behind them and kind of show you what I mean here. So this Eric Dickerson 1984 is, his, his normal 84 tops is the classic one with his like, like crazy haircut with the glasses. And that card, there's thousands of copies that are graded by PSA. But this card was very unique in that you had to, there was a mailer that was sent out in 1984, or 1983, whatever. There was a mailer sent out to people that were like subscribed to Tops, their mailing lists. And you could mail that into Tops, and they would send you this a glossy set or maybe it was an individual card. I don't know exactly how they send it to you, but they sent you glossy send in. That's what this refers to, glossy send in cards. And because of that, not a lot of people did it. The card company didn't do this to make this card rare. They just offered a fun service of, hey, if you want these more unique cards, just send us this thing, we'll send you these cards. They weren't making money off this. They were just doing this to, as like a, almost like a fan service, like, hey, here's just a cool promotion going on. And if you wanna do it, feel free. So because of that, these cards were very rare. There's thousands of the 84 regular tops Eric Dickerson's, but there's, I think there's little over a hundred maybe of these, so, uh, multitude rarer but it, that wasn't intentional they just made this item for fun basically and it turned into a rare item because not a lot of people capitalized on it but then decades later people said hey i want the rarest eric dickerson rookie here it is right here it's not the top space you'd find in a pack so that was a genuine rarity it was not the intent of the company to make an item just to make it rare and same thing with trainer deck b so trainer deck b is set apart from uh, first edition base in the sense that first edition base was sold on shelves and it was an intentional promotion to be rare. But Trainer Deck B was not even meant for resale. They weren't making money off of Trainer Deck B. Trainer Deck A and Trainer Deck B were given out to like uh, gym leaders and like owners of shops, of like card shops. And they were given these decks that were very clearly marked as trainer deck, trainer like deck decks, to teach kids how to play the game, to try and drive uh, popularity for this new product. So these cards were given to gym leaders. They said, "Hey, play with these, teach the kids." This wasn't printed as a way to um, to add chase to a pack or something because you couldn't get this in a pack. This was just given out, and that unintentional rule, like release made these cards very rare. I mean, it was an intentional release, but it was unintentional in the sense that this wasn't made to be a chase card. This was made to just be, hey, use this, teach the kids, then throw it away, do whatever, whatever you want with it. So because of that, very few of these survived. And that rarity became a, like a genuine chase for people. And it, it's much more organic than a stamp or a rarity level, like a hollow. Like even if this didn't have a first edition stamp, this would still be a manufactured rarity in the sense that it is a hollow in a pack. It is meant to be the chase card. They, they made a lot less of these than they did of the common, obviously. The hollow is meant to be the chase. Same thing with EXs, level Xs, full arts. Uh, every rarity scheme breaks, even like up to now with like alt art. People are going crazy for all, all, all alternate arts. Those are manufactured rarity. They are made to be rare in a pack to drive demand for that product. And they're beautiful cards. This isn't a knock on the card itself. It's just a knock on when you're looking for a rare item, 
Think about how it is rare. People are paying $100,000 for a Trevor Lawrence one of one. It's only a one of one because uh, Panini decided to print a one of one on it and give it, the, give it the black background. It's manufactured in that sense. One of ones are highly sought after, but they are made to be a cash grab. They're like they're, they're made knowing this card will be valuable. People will chase this card. This card will sell boxes. And that's very important because when you think about the holy grails in the hobby, it's not a, it's not a coincidence that all these holy grails came naturally, inorganically for their rarity. I'm gonna show a few, I'm gonna talk about a few. I, I don't have any of these obviously because like they're all $100,000 or more cards, but I'm gonna go over a few of the, the, the grails in the hobby and explain how all of those rarities are formed organically, not intentionally by the company. So the first one is the T206 Honus Wagner. The T206 Honus Wagner was, first of all, it's from like 1910, so it'd be rare anyway, because not a lot have survived uh, of that entire set. But Honus Wagner in particular is very rare because he asked the company to pull his cards from the cigarette packs because he didn't want his card, which is normally like a children's product, a baseball card, he didn't want that to be associated with cigarettes. So he, he pulled his cards from those products. So because of that, there was a lot less released of him than the other players like Ty Cobb. That's why the Honus Wagner is a grail and there's there's so few of them that have survived. Though there was one that was someone, there was a card, it was a Honus Wagner and there was like a cut across here. It was like two thirds of a card of a Honus Wagner and it still sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's part of an authentic Honus Wagner. Now, uh, this goes on to the 52 Tops Mickey Mantle as well. The 52 Mantle is rare because many of those copies were dumped into the Atlantic Ocean because uh, the product wasn't selling well and the people that printed it needed space for other things. So they took a lot of those boxes of 52 Tops and just literally threw it in the Atlantic Ocean. They were uh, in the in, uh, on Long Island when they threw them in. And because of that, 52 Tops is very short print, is very is much there's lower production quantities compared to other sets and the 52 mantle is the pull is like the big rookie card of that set so that was intention unintentionally sorry it was an unintentional unintentional rarity they weren't thinking about the value down the line the cards weren't even selling in stores that's why they literally threw them away and same thing with uh with pokemon with the illustrator the most sought after card in the hobby it's rare because it was, it was given away for free to winners of a contest over 20 years ago. It was, it, it was made like at the inception of the IP of Pokemon. It was not made to make money like First Edition Base was. First Edition Base, for everything amazing that it is, I love First Edition Base, it was made to make money. The Illustrator, they didn't make money off that. They, were, they gave it out as a reward for a... A, um, like a like a fun challenge it was like a competition to uh draw pictures of pokemon and sure you could say oh well, it, it's made to like kind of further the further that product but you can say that about anything but they weren't making money on it they didn't intend it to be the holy grail they just had said hey we're gonna do this fun contest we're gonna give you a card um if you win as a as like a thank you that you can take home and show your friends or whatever and that just organically just the story of that and the rarity that's what took and drove that card to where it is now and that's why like these like this card that's what sets this apart from the other 84 tops eric dickerson that's what sets trainer deck b apart from the other the other base set cards and so when you're looking for a card just simply saying there's a hundred of that card it doesn't do the whole story justice is there a hundred of that card because there's just because there's a stamp on the back telling you that because that was made intentionally to be rare and if you if, if you like that like awesome go for it but there is a noticeable difference in the perception of an item with genuine rarity versus a contrived rarity scheme now things like alternate arts and pokemon those cards are beautiful and that while it, it was made to be a chase card those cards will be valuable in the future because so many people love them. I'm not saying a manufactured rarity will reduce in value.
because of that. I'm just, I'm simply saying it's an important distinction to make when looking at an item, when understanding an item, that how did that rarity come out? Did 52 tops become valuable because the tops company wanted it to? No, it, it was actually the opposite. It was valuable because at the time nobody cared about it. The 84 tops send it is, is valuable because people didn't really capitalize on that promotion and it became rare because of that. It wasn't a, a cash grab from tops to add some rarity to their products. So I wanted to go over those things, kind of show you a few examples of both, just to kind of get you thinking. I made these, de de these definitions and this distinction up just in from my own years of collecting. I would, when I would look for a rare item, I would kind of look to see why it was rare. And I kind of developed that distinction on my own. And personally, I gravitate towards uh, the natural rarity. Like I would rather own an item like this that has a story behind it over just a card with a stamp on it personally. Uh, but what do you think about that distinction? Do you think it makes sense? Do you agree with it? Uh, yeah, let me know what you think. Take care.